Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I call to order the sixth session of the seventh, uh, the sixth meeting rather, of the seventh session of the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development Goals. This afternoon, in accordance with our program, uh, we will have a panel discussion, an interactive exchange of views on sustainable consumption and production, including chemicals and waste. I am pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists. And our first panelist is Mr. William McDonnell. Trained as an architect, Mr. McDonnell has written and lectured extensively on design. In 1996, Mr. McDonough received the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development, and in 2004, the National Design Award for Achievement in the Field of Environmental, of Environmental Design. He is the former Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he still serves as Professor of Business Administration and Alumni Research at the Darden School of Business. Our second panelist will be uh, Mr. Carty Sardilia from the Blacksmith Institute, an expert in development policy and strategy. Mr. Sardilia works closely with the Blacksmith Institute to end toxic pollution in some of the world's most polluted places. A former resident director of the Asian Development Bank, he also <coughs> held several senior positions in the Indian government. Our third panelist is Mr. Helio Mata. Um, Mr. Mata, who is sitting on my far left, serves as president of the Akatu Institute for Conscious Consumption, in which, which aims to motivate consumers to, if, uh, to effect large-scale social change in creating a more sustainable planet. He has held a number of positions in the private sector and government, including president and CEO of General Electric Appliances, Brazil, and Secretary of Production Development in the Ministry of Development, Industry, and Foreign Trade, I would assume in Brazil as well. So uh, before I give the floor to the panelists, I would just like to confirm with them that, we will, that the presentations will be uh, no more than 10 to 15 minutes. I would like to open uh, the working group to devote uh, so that we can devote the bulk of time uh, to the interactive dialogue which we've been having, which has been working very well. So, uh, without much further ado, let me ask, uh, now invite the first speaker, Mr. McDonnell, to address the Open Working Group. You have the floor, Mr. McDonnell. You need to press your button over there. Uh, there's a little button on the there. You got it. Oh, is that working now? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk as a designer about human intention. And I'll be speaking in a, two weeks in Switzerland at the World Economic Forum for CEOs and NGOs on the issues around thinking about sustainability at a very large scale and in a business context. I have to ask myself occasionally if the word sustainability is the right word for us all to use, because if I asked you what your relationship was with your spouse and you said sustainable, I would probably have to say I'm sorry. So if sustainability is just maintenance, perhaps we could go beyond it. So what I'd like to do is talk about what it might be to go beyond sustainability. And if we think about the Limits to Growth document prepared by the Club of Rome, such an important document in the early 70s. Now, in 84, we have Brundtland Commission. And we start to realize this idea of limits to growth is fundamentally critical to us to understand that as population increases and the materials and resources available to us um, are only fueled by sunlight, um, that we have this issue of limits to growth. But what would it mean to work with them in a positive way? So I'd like to look quickly at then, now, and next, and I'd like to talk about moving from being less bad, which is obviously a good thing to do, but is being less bad being good? Or is it by definition being bad just less so? 
And so what would it mean to be more good? So then we see in the world for many centuries here a poem by a German doctor, poet, um, glance at the sun, see the moon and the stars, gaze at the beauty of the earth's greenings, now think. And what we see here, though, is a statement that we delight in these things, but nature is at the disposal of humankind. We are to work with it, for without it we cannot survive. We are to work with it. It is our disposal. Interesting words. And in 1836, Emerson was invited by Harvard University to discuss the issue of if humans are natural, are therefore all things made by humans part of nature? And his conclusion was nature is all those things that are immutable, the things too big for humans to change. Space, the air, the river, the leaf. Well, I think we realize today we can change those things. In Limits to Growth, they used the metaphor of a lily pond and said, in a world of finite resources, the lily pond, when we increase the lilies by a factor of two every day, we see doubling rates you know, every uh, seven years. And it's, you think that the lily pond is there for your use as these increases go until even on the second to last day, it looks like we still have a lily pond, but the next day, it's over. So the idea of exponential growth in a world of limited resources is a fundamental one. And so at the Earth Summit in 1992, we heard from the scientific community in Russia, the former USSR, we were told, was 16% uninhabitable by their scientists. 16% uninhabitable. They call it ecocide. Imagine that. And what we hear now from China about toxic soils where we can't grow food, air, so on, things that we hear around the world, this is something to worry about, not just because this is our home, but also we do have this need to meet our needs. And if we look at this famous definition coming from the UN and the Brundtland Commission um, on meeting our needs without compromising future generations, this is a human rights issue because Future generations do not need to suffer from our tyranny. Freedom from tyranny is a human rights issue, and the tyranny of our use of materials and our toxification of the planet is an issue of rights. But it's also not just about need, it's also about want and love. Things, people, places, cultures. So we, we have... A, put together, obviously, in the discussions of sustainability as a culture around the world, this notion that we have equity and economies, society and the markets, social market economies, but we have to add to that the ecology. And so we now have this three-part consideration that is famously characterized as sustainable development. So what are we doing now? Well, astonishing things have been done in the world of efficiency, and I'm sure you heard much about that this morning. And it's an amazingly important concept to do more with less, absolutely. And to take the things we don't want and do less of them, absolutely. These are important things to do. But perhaps there's a chance to change this agenda and the framework slightly so that we can perceive it both as being less bad and being more good simultaneously. And from a business perspective, what this gets to is quite interesting. Because if we take the things we don't want and we put them in corporate social responsibility reports where we show how we're reducing our badness to zero and our goal is zero, we are saying where we don't want to go. Is this going to get us there? Well, wait a minute. Where is there if zero is our goal? This would be like going, you know, driving north to Canada at 100 kilometers an hour, but we're meant to be going to Brazil. Does it help us to slow down to 20? Of course it does. But does it get us to Brazil? We have to turn around. So I think if we could combine this idea that we would be less bad with the things we don't want with what we do want, something interesting can happen to business. This is a report from a major 
company showing their emissions over 20 years. And you see the black line is their business growth. They have increased in size by four, and their emissions have pretty much been maintained. And there was some period where they were using offsets. So essentially, they've achieved a factor for reduction in emissions per unit of revenue, which is quite admirable, of course. But it's also interesting to imagine that they can, we can go beyond this and ask ourselves, why these emissions? At what point in history did we say we want to pollute? When did we say it's okay to pollute, and if we do it a little less so, it's more okay? Why are we polluting at all? And so if we look by design, we can start to realize we can start optimizing designs to be beneficial from the start. And if we start to imagine what they look like, we realize that being efficient is a really important agenda because we can minimize our negatives and we can show incredible cost performance on doing these things, just as simple business. It's a marvelous thing to do. But will it get us to Brazil? Will it get us where we want to go if our goal is zero? So I think we can put together an optimized goal of positive things and they could be represented by a path that we could call effectiveness. Peter Drucker, the famous management consultant, said it's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way. But it's an executive's job to do the right thing. Because if you're doing something the right way, but you're doing something bad, if you're a criminal and you're efficient, you're worse, you see? So the question becomes, what is the right thing to do? Then let's do that efficiently, see? A tool does not know its value, only a human does. A hammer doesn't know if it's a good or a bad. The human using the hammer can use it as a weapon or as a tool to build a home for someone, you see? It's our intention that gives us our values. So what is next? Design is the first signal of human intention. So what I would like to imagine is we're all designers now, and we intend something for our future generations. And we intend to grow the things that we would like, local culture, music, children, creativity, education, healthy water, healthy soil, clean air. What do we want to grow? Not just what do we want to worry about that's bad, but what do we want to create that's good, you see? So these are our choices. And they are choices by intention and by design. So I'm keeping this at 12 minutes. And so to finish, I would like to just talk about what would it be like to be good? So let's imagine what good looks like. So we have the stuff we don't want and the things we do. Let's take the things that we're trying to reduce and put them on the chart where we might want them, which is below the line. And then as we remove them, we're going up to the right, which is what people like to see. That's improvement. Good. So taking away the things we don't want is a good thing to do. And then we can articulate the things that we do want. So on the bottom, it might be reduce carbon emissions. Carbon emissions in the atmosphere are a toxin. A toxin is defined as a material in the wrong place. Carbon in the atmosphere at this point is a toxin. Lead in a child's brain is a neurotoxin. So we don't want toxins, let's reduce them, good. But what do we want? How about renewable power, clean power, clean water, like that. So how do we achieve more good? So we've developed this chart. I work with a German chemist, Michael Braungart, and we created a chart we call our upcycling chart, where on the left are all your undefined options and your opportunities, departments of a biz business or communities or materials in a product. Then we have a filter of our values and on the right, we show how we improve and in all cases by removing the things we don't want through efficiency, et cetera, and increasing the things we do want. And we look at materials as nutrients. We see them for reutilization, not just disposal. We see renewable energy, water stewardship, and a fair society. We inventory materials by goodness uh, and things of concern and the range in between. We see the world as two op optimized metabolisms. One is the biological one that we physically inhabit ourselves as people. So we design things safe for the biosphere. You can do this. We design things that are safe for the, um, for the technosphere. 
things that can go back to industry forever without contaminating the biosphere. And we can see these as products as services, for example, a television as a service, not as a set of molecules that you bought. We, these things have been executed by companies, textiles in Switzerland where the water coming from the mill is clean enough to drink. The trimming, instead of being hazardous waste the week before, it becomes nutrients for gardeners. These are changes that can be done cost effectively by design. We see things like carpet where nylon becomes nylon, polyolefin, polyolefin, and companies are storing their materials on their customers' floors in safe, healthy ways for endless reuse by human societies over many generations. So the commerce and the question, it moves from one of a taking of the world, where we take, make, waste, and instead, we talk about a culture of generosity. So instead of asking a commercial question of each other around the world, which simply says, how much can I get for how little I give? We change it. We ask the question, how much can we give for all that we get? Because in the natural world, fueled by the solar energy as the only form of income, on the planet, growth is good. A tree that grows is good. A child that grows is good. And if we think about Yuri Gagarin, the first human to go to space, returning as the cosmonaut, his helmet was removed, and they said, Commander Gagarin, what was it like? Do you remember what he said? It was blue. If we look at the Earth from outer space, we see water, we see plants, we see ancient soils, many of which have oil under them, and we see white, frozen water. And in our world, they're all good, and growth is good, and we see the white slowly disappearing. We see the green and the brown moving around, and we have to ask ourselves, how do humans move from limits to growth? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McDonough. I have a feeling we'll have an interesting conversation about that in a few minutes. I'd now like to ask our next uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Sandelia, to please uh, go right ahead and make your presentation. And by the way, Mr. McDonald, thank you for keeping to good time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kocher. I hope I can... I think I'll take some quick responses. Um, I hope they can be punchy and uh, to the point um, so that uh, we can uh, take up as many of those questions as we possibly can. Um, and who would like to start? Shall we start with Mr. Mac uh, McDonough? Since you're at the far end, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, let me address some of these in reverse, perhaps. Um, this question of consumption and patterns, uh, we, we wrote a book called Cradle to Cradle um, 10 years ago, and now a book called The Upcycle. And one thing to understand is that when we talk about consumption, I think the very first rule of order we should put on ourselves is the fact that most of the things that you talk about as consumption products cannot be consumed. That's part of the problem. You don't consume a television set. You don't consume a car, right? If I said, here's a television set, it's 4,360 chemicals, I encourage you to take it home, have your children play with it, right? Is that did you go to buy the chemicals? No, you went to get the television to watch television, right? You want the service of it. So, so I think one really important thing that the UN could do is distinguish between what we would call a consumable and a product of service. Because if we design, and what we've protocoled in Cradle to Cradle is that materials that are designed for the biological systems are consumable. Paper, toothpaste, Things that are going back to the natural world that we can put to methane, use it for repolymerization, back to soil safely are consumables. Things that you are the customer for, the car and so on, 
are materials and systems that can be designed to go back to the technosphere and designed for separation. So where can the companies play a role in this? Certainly the chemical industry can design packaging and products that are able to go back to methane if they're, if they're consumable and able to be taken back to industry. One good example is uh, one of the electronic companies is used a, an adhesive developed by the adhesive industry that can unglue so that you can actually glue an electronic object together and then instead of saying, oh no, we have this terrible thing of all these metals and, and lost materials to human use for generations and we're toxifying with it, you can actually put that electronic in an oven and heat it up and the glue stops working and it all falls apart and all the materials can be sorted and then reused again. So the real question that we have to ask ourselves is what are the policy and corporate behaviors that are actually design behaviors? Because what we're talking about is a design problem. If the product was never designed to be consumed, then let's not talk about it as a consumable because it wasn't designed to be consumed. So let's design things for consumption that go back to biology. Let's design things for technology that go back to technology so that cars become cars or other things and so on. Then we have a system that has the resources to manage, as we heard from, um, the, from Professor Matar, about, about sharing something. It's worth sharing. But it's a design problem. The things we're dealing with were never designed to be recycled. They were never designed to be consumed. And we could have a massive impact on that by just saying, what is the difference between a consumable and being a customer and being a consumer? You cannot consume a car. Get over it. OK? I'll go quickly. If we look at nature for an example, because we're going to have 10 billion of us Look at the ants and the body mass of ants. They're probably three times that of humans, and yet they don't seem to have a waste problem. I think they're fully employed, and they're not an overpopulation. Isn't that interesting? Ants take things and put them back into the natural world where they cycle. And we don't talk about end of life with ants. Why are we talking about end of life for a battery? It is not alive. It is an object of use, and it is used in a way that causes toxic conditions. We can design these things so that they don't cause toxic conditions. Lead is a solder in here. If it gets into the biosphere, it's a toxin. If it gets back into a technical system that uses lead as a solder without contaminating the biosphere, it's a technical nutrient. If everything is a nutrient, then we become like ants, and there's plenty of jobs. Just look at the ants. So yes, reduce, absolutely, be efficient. Reuse, but reuse differently. Think about reuse, not just I'm gonna use this again um, in some demeaned way, like make a water bottle into a flower pot as it down cycles into something ridiculous. Think of reuse in terms of everything designed for reuse. So what's next becomes the design question for the thing you're designing today. Because right now things are not designed for what's next, because they have no what's next designed in them. So endless reuse is absolutely essential to the design criteria, and it's not in the SDGs. All they say, be more efficient, do reduction, and worry about end of life assessment. Well, as long as you say you're gonna do end of life, you're doing end of life. Well, what did it do? It died on you. So it's gone from human utility? Is that what happened? We call it take, make, waste. We call, do a life cycle assessment from procurement to disposal. Disposal? Goodbye is disposal, so no more goodbyes. Put that in there. So reduce, reuse, recycle indeed, and redesign so it can be recycled for infinite human use. That's what Cradle to Cradle is focused on, is designed for endless reuse in biological technical cycles. When we think the other thing about these batteries, for example, if we look at the lead example, which is so critical, that, that we also see now, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a new battery that's been invented, the most astonishing thing. It uses seawater and cotton. It's essentially using salt water and, and uh, a fiber. So let's say car fibers, and it's a battery. If we think about it, innovation is gonna be critical to all of this. So it's not just that we wanna take the old stuff that was suboptimal and use it over and over again, Perhaps we want to see these new things where we leapfrog, where we don't need physical objects, we need the services like telephones become wireless and so on. So we have to write innovation into it, but it's principled innovation. We're not looking for new weapons of mass destruction in the form of a battery. 
we're looking for new designs that are ecologically intelligent for all generations. So we have to design innovation into this, and we have to move it quickly in order to achieve any of these goals. So I'd just like to finish. I love that statement from Johannesburg because I think in the end, you know, the privilege of being in this room with this group of people and with the United Nations being that agency for this transformation is a marvelous and important thing for the whole, all of us. And it's going to take us all. It's going to take forever. But that is the point. Thank you. Okay. An applause for all of them, I suppose. I want to thank all of our speakers uh, this afternoon.